Hello everyone, Steve Goodwin here with my anchor test video number 147. Today we'll be looking at this Wedge 8 in stainless steel. Now the anchor did come out at 17 pounds on my scale and when in the setting position the tip came out at 7 pounds for a tip to total weight ratio in the low 40 percentile, which is quite high. Uh, the very highest tip to total weight percentage that I've ever tested is a Mantis M1, that's about 50%. And then on down the line, you can get into the lower teens with some of the lighter tip to total weight ratio anchors. So that should produce some fairly positive tendencies to roll upright and bury that tip into the seabed. Now, speaking of the Mantis M1 and the Viking anchors, they're all quite similar. They all share this sort of similar fluke plan form where the ears or the locations where the roll bars are attached are well outboard from the main part of the fluke. And what this does is it, in addition to increasing the tip weight when it's in a sitting position, it also elevates the crown or the back part of the anchor upward and aims the fluke tip perhaps at a better or more favorable angle for penetrating. Now the anchor did come supplied with a swivel. Unfortunately, the gap or the width of the opening in which the chain would be inserted is too small for the chain that I use to test all these anchors. I use 5 16 chain and I don't want to change chain size just for this anchor because, well, we wouldn't get apples to apples catenary and it would just throw off all the results of the test. So for these tests, I did not use this supplied swivel. And speaking of chain attachment, this is a 3 8 shackle, and that's what I normally use for this size anchor, and that fits perfectly with 5 16 chain. However, for the wedge, it doesn't go. The hole's just not big enough. So for these tests, I used a 5 16 shackle. I went ahead and used it with 5 16 chain. So in this case, the shackle would be a weak link, but arguably, 5 16 chain is a bit excessive strength-wise, for anchors in this category. Um, also, a smaller quarter inch shackle could be used, and there's no binding, but now we're starting to get a little bit on the weak side uh, for boats that would be using an anchor of this size. Okay, I'll go over a few features of this anchor. First of all, the shank profile is not unlike a Delta or a Rockna anchor, and I'll say that it is a bit taller than a Mantis M1 shank, but it is a bit shorter than the Viking shank. Also, this whole anchor is made of 316L stainless steel. Uh, none of it deflected or bent during any of the tests. I'll mention that a quick set 22 in, I believe, 304 stainless steel did bend the shank during a reset test, and this one stayed whole. And then also the roll bar bent back on the Mantis anchor during a soft mud straight line pull. Once again, this anchor did not bend with a similar pulling number. Uh, the workmanship of the anchor seems very, very good. There's um, a weld joint here that is perfect. Um, overall, really nicely finished. It looks like it has been electroplated. Um, other features include this wedge palm. It's a sort of a turned up trailing edge feature, not unlike the trailing edge of a Rockna anchor. Uh, however, this component is removable via one bolt. Uh, also, we'll notice that the plates on which the roll bar is welded and then the whole thing is bolted to the fluke. Those plates contain these turned down elements, not unlike a Viking anchor, and I believe the purpose of those is to keep the anchor upright or prevent it from rolling. Uh, what could happen, and this is just my theory, is that if the anchor is tipped, say, this way, the tab or the ear of the anchor that is at the lower or deeper into the seabed, well that seabed is going to be more firm and have more of a lifting tendency because it's pointed down. Uh, meanwhile, the other side is going to be in less dense seabed or perhaps even above the seabed and it'll tend to roll it back into the upright position. Again, just a theory. I think that's what the idea with those are. Also, we'll notice that the roll bar has been flattened on top. I think the idea with that is to lessen the frontal area of the roll bar without re reducing strength. And again, roll bar did not bend in any of the tests, so I think that achieved its goal. Now, so far, I have been testing the 20-pound range anchors in seven different seabeds. Now, two of them are not going to be included in this film. Uh, one is the surf sand seabed out at Ocean Shores on the Pacific Coast. It's just too far to go for one anchor. 
And then the other is the anchorage at Susha Island up in the San Juan Islands. Again, uh, too far to go for just this anchor. Eventually I'll get back up there with it and some others that, that need to be tested there. But for now, we're going to look at the footage of five different seabeds and tests right here near Port Townsend. Let's get to it. Okay, we'll start things off with the reset testing here in the sandy mud. Uh, the scope is up to 5 to 1 for these first ones, and we'll see right off the bat that the anchor has real trouble uh, digging in. Uh, the, the, the toe certainly got a foot foothold in, but uh, once a little thrust was applied, only a couple hundred pounds, anchor just pops right out, and it was very poor. Did, did tried some resets, and it was no good. It was as bad as any other anchor I've tested here uh, in, in this test, in this seabed. And what I found was that seabed was packed into the fluke and even packed in and up against that wedge palm. And I'm going to go ahead and do, give it another try just to make sure there wasn't an anomaly. Maybe there was something on the anchor, something else on the anchor that we couldn't see. So here is that second try, same conditions, wedge palm still installed. And it was no change. Uh, initial set was very low holding power. And I uh, tried a whole bunch of resets and really not, really no ability for it to, to, to dig in and get a good foothold. Again, this was as bad as any anchor I've tested here. And the best anchors, you can hardly get them to move at all with the boat. You can, uh, well, if you do a reset at maybe three or four knots and keep the speed up, the anchor will fly. But if, it's, if these better anchors are touching the bottom, they just, they just grab right in and reset. So here after that next try, same deal, uh, lots of mud packed in and especially packed into the forward face of that wedge palm. So now we're looking at footage from several years ago where I ground and pounded the trailing edge turned up flap of a certain Rockna anchor that performed extremely poorly in the same uh, 180 degree reset test. In fact, it was quite similar to what we just saw with that wedge. And what happened with that Rockna is it improved it night and day. It made it uh, reset and, and it, it would hold uh, decent boat thrust. Uh, big, big change. So uh, we're doing the same thing here with the wedge. No, we didn't have to uh, grind or pound on it. We just simply removed it and we'll see if it makes a difference and how much. And right off the bat, there is a huge difference. Here we're, we're pulling very hard, um, up to just about 1,000 pounds, and it just digs in wonderfully. In fact, it goes completely out of sight. That's pretty rare for a roll bar anchor to do that in this seabed under any circumstances. And here we've, we've got really light chains, so we, we are pulling upward on the shank a fair amount. And it was brilliant. Just dove right out of sight. Here, the first reset, I went really fast. I'm up three and a half knots, and the anchor's flying, but it contacts the seabed, rolls upright, and bam, hammers itself right in. So that's excellent. Now, I can't say that all 10 of these resets were perfect, uh, but more than half of them were. And even once the anchor did start to become a bit more fouled, maybe a little bit of weed on it, it would still reset, but it just didn't have quite as much resetting power. And that, I'll mention, was very similar performance to a Mantis M1 anchor. Here's the anchor on retrieval, and we'll see that in the after part of the fluke where that wedge palm was, we see that there's uh, a mud has already fallen off just on its own. Uh, there is a cutout in the fluke back there. There's a W. And as I've shown in other videos, that holes in flukes do indeed uh, help out with this mud fouling issue. Now I've gone ahead and give it another try without the mud palm installed. Uh, we're down to 3.5 to 1 scope now, and this is the scope that I use to rate the anchors. So it's really, really extreme. There's very little chain and very steep scope. So uh, initial set was very good. It held a good burst of power. And once again... Uh, a little better than half of the reset attempts in this condition were successful. So that's really quite good. Again, it's at a very extreme test. You could almost call this as an extreme short scope setting test. And for any anchor to, to work at all under these conditions, is uh, uh, it's really quite good. So that, let's call this a, a good success. Uh, again, it's on par with a Mantis M1 anchor, but not, not quite as good as the very best. And I believe it was the 17-pound Excel number 1 
that was absolutely the best in this uh, particular test. And we see on retrieval there is a fair amount of mud and weed that's packed into the forward part of the fluke, and yeah, that's why the anchor eventually starts to suffer a bit in the resets. It's really quite tenacious. Uh, there's been many people that have claimed that stainless steel is more slippery than galvanized, but boy, all my years of of playing with mud here on these anchors, I really don't feel a difference. I'm, I'm starting to question whether that's a valid thing or not. But here's one more try here. This is, again, 3.5 to 1 scope, just repeating it. And I've been repeating all these tests so, so heavily here just to make sure that these findings are real and there's no anomalies. And it's, it's, it's absolutely the case. Uh, without the wedge palm installed, the anchor is fantastically better than with it installed in this seabed. So that brings up a big question. What do I do for the rest of the tests? And I'm going to go ahead and do most of them without the wedge installed, even when I go to different seabeds, because, well, if I had this anchor in use here in the Puget Sound, and I wouldn't really know exactly which kind of seabed I'm in, I wouldn't want to run the risk of having the wedge palm installed in a seabed such as this. Here's one of the straight line holding power checks that I conducted here in the sandy mud. And the of the three pulls that I averaged together, I came up with the average of 650 pounds. Uh, the worst anchor here in this category or this class of anchors was a claw anchor at 23 pounds, which only held 200 pounds of, of thrust. And the very best was a 21 pound spade at 60, which was able to hold over 1,500 pounds of thrust. Last test here in the sandy mud is a veer test at 535 pounds continuous pull throughout 180 degrees of veer. I did use a longer chain. This is 80 feet of chain at 5 to 1 scope, so the angle of pull at the anchor will be near horizontal. Notice that the anchor does dive completely out of sight and remains engaged and completely buried throughout 180 degrees of veer. We are watching the playback at 8 times speed to keep the video at a reasonable length. It was just just wonderful performance throughout the veer. The only thing is at the end, when I straighten the boat out and increase thrust, uh, it wasn't able to cope with anything more. So it was right at the, the ragged edge of its holding power envelope, yet it was able to maintain uh, its, its buried condition. So overall, that was very successful. And now we've moved over to the clean, loose sand seabed for another veer test. This is another 535 pound baseline, 180 degree veer attempt. And I say attempt because although the anchor was able to initially hold that target thrust, it released immediately upon commencing the veer and really did not want to reset. On retrieval, I found a large live clam sort of wedged in to that nub at the leading edge of the shank. So I think that was a factor. So let's disregard this test and we'll give it another try. Okay, here's the second try for that clean sand veer here at 535 pounds baseline. And sure enough, the initial set was great, held that target thrust. And it did uh, execute the veer quite well with a few hiccups. Uh, the first happened at the 45 degree mark and it had just a real quick little jump out and immediate reset all on its own. Then at the 100 degree mark, it had a full release, and what we're seeing here is the aftermath from that. And it didn't feel like it was going to reset unless I chopped the power and let the boat speed decay a bit. And then once I did that, it immediately reset. And then it finished out the veer here just fine, not very much motion at all. Now here at the final stages of the test, I've got the boat straightened out and I'm increasing thrust ever more and more. And above about 800 pounds of pull, it started having continuous motion and it never stopped. However, it is significant to say that it uh, was well over 1,100 pounds when it finally did have a full release. And 1,100 pounds in a boat that would normally be used with this size of anchor, that is a lot of pull. We're talking well into storm or perhaps hurricane force wind. Next is a straight line holding power check in the cobblestone seabed. This is a seabed that these smaller anchors have great difficulty achieving high holding power. 
Uh, in fact, none of these anchors in this size range can really do much, but this one did better than most. Uh, three times it was able to resist 120 pounds of pull, and then once it dug in enough to hold 135 pounds. And after that, uh, we get full releases, and we get perfect resets because there's nothing really to foul the anchors here. The weeds are very light and thin. And there's uh, very little binder, so the anchors always come up nice and clean. Here the anchor is struggling to get a tow in, and it eventually does and brings the boat to a stop. I've probably got about that 120 pounds of pull right now. And there, just there it stopped, and it would hold that. But then part of the test is I just increase power once it's held for a bit, and sure enough, it starts dragging once again. But again, it repeated this, the same set and release over and over, very consistent. I'll rate it at 135 pounds holding. Next is another straight line holding check, this time in the cobble sand seabed. The seabed consists of golf ball sized cobblestone in a thin layer on top of rather clean sand. I note that there is rarely or if ever any binder adhered to the anchors on retrieval so it's a very consistent non-fouling type seabed and the test is simply to increase power until the anchor drags and then reduce power till it stops dragging again and repeat that over and over and indeed it's very very consistent. This anchor was able to hold multiple times. Uh, 350 pounds of pull with no motion, and then it would release at the next power increment of 395 pounds. This gives it a rating of 20 units of holding per anchor weight, and I'll note that the very best anchor, the Mantis M2, best in this seabed that is, it could hold as much as 60 units of holding per anchor weight, and the worst was the 23 pound claw at only 4 units of holding per anchor weight. Okay, next is straight line holding power test in the soft mud at Scow Bay. First, I tested without the wedge palm, and then the next test was with the wedge palm. I'll go ahead and say that both conditions produce the exact same holding power results, and that's not too surprising. Um, earlier, I mentioned that the well, that original Rockna anchor that had such problems in the sandy mud that was fixed by removing its turned up trailing edge and then we saw the wedge had a similar situation uh, the point is is that the Rockna does really really well here so the presumption is that this type of seabed seems to keep moving past the anchor and whatever obstructions the anchor may have and it, it just doesn't matter um, seems to be a factor of whether or not there's sand mixed in with the mud but in any case here is the second try this is with the wedge reinstalled on the anchor and again in both both conditions the uh, results are the same it was holding solid with zero knots on the GPS at 535 pounds and then at higher numbers uh, higher pull numbers the anchor was moving continuously uh, it reached two knots at 790 pounds so that's when I cut things off and there was never any tendency to release and these numbers are as good as it gets for non-pivoting fluke anchors. Only the Mantis M1 and the Viking anchor are as good. Okay, the last test here for this video is a 180 degree reset test here in the soft mud. We've got short chain, only 12 feet of chain installed and 5 to 1 scope. There's the first reset. It's the first of 5 and that was uh, no problem. Second reset also went just fine. Maybe a little more motion. Maybe there was a backflip. Third reset here might have been just a pivot or rotation with the anchor never releasing or never, never coming near the surface at all. It's about a 300 pound burst of thrust after each of these resets. Fourth one, again, real good, hardly any motion. And then the last one, that had a little bit of trouble. It was clearly a backflip. You can see the underside of the fluke there. I believe the anchor did rotate into the correct position, but the camera came fouled. Couldn't really tell exactly what happened. I went ahead and chopped some of it out, but here's the aftermath. The camera became in view again, and the anchor looks like it's on its side. Maybe it's partially fouled and it was very marginal. I couldn't really get it to reset, even slowing the boat down, down to a walking speed. 
Here's a look at the latest ranking chart for the 20 pound range anchors. We'll see that the wedge has ended up quite high. It's uh, number four from the top there and just above the Mantis M1. We'll notice there are a few columns there that are missing and if we plugged in or used the Mantis M1 numbers and plugged them into the wedge uh, spots there. We'll see that the wedge will come down a notch or two, but uh, take that with a grain of salt. This chart isn't meant to be definitive. It's more of a general guide in, in interpreting what happens with the tests that you are watching. Now let's just go through these real quickly. Uh, the wedge was just a little below average, let's say, in the uh, resetting in the sandy mud and then in the sandy mud holding. It was, again, it got a 2.5, maybe a little below average. Uh, looked like it was right in the middle of the pack with a number three for the Sandy Mud Veer. Cobblestone holding was better than average. That was a four. Uh, soft mud holding is right at the top. That was a five. And the soft mud reset was a four. It was four out of five successful resets. Notice that the Mantis M1 was a five out of five for that soft mud reset. Uh, the wedge did a little better than the clean sand holding than that Mantis. Uh, same for the clean sand veer. That was a two. And then, of course, we're missing the surf sand, Susha Island holding, and the Susha Island reset. Uh, but at the far left there in the performance categories, we see that it was, once again, the same as the Mantis with a 2.5 for the cobble sand holding. Uh, do not have price information as of the publishing of this video. I'm going to give the engineering and strength a three right in the middle of the pack. Uh, galvanizing and corrosion is a five. We don't have galvanizing on this anchor. And the tip total weight ratio is a four. So overall, a very solid performer. Here's a look at the latest 20 pound range performance graph. If we ignore the red bars, that's the cobblestone holding, uh, these, none of these anchors really can perform in that, 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 that seabed, so let's just ignore that. Uh, and then focus on the 20 horizontal line. That represents 20 units of holding for each anchor weight unit. And it's arbitrary, but if we assume that to be sort of a minimum for safe, stronger wind anchoring, we'll find that there are only three anchors that have all the other seabeds above that line. And they are the 21-pound Viking, the 17-pound Mantis, and now the 17-pound Wedge. So overall, the Wedge is a very well-rounded performer. Okay, that's a wrap for this Wedge 8 anchor. And overall, that is a fine anchor. Good overall performance. Uh, if I had to critique it, I'd say make the chain attach point a little bigger so that it could accommodate a 5 16 or excuse me, a 3 8 inch shackle and therefore 5 16 chain. Uh, also, for people that like to use swivels, it would be nice if this opening or chain acceptance location was able to handle a little bigger chain. Uh, the other question I'd have is whether or not to use this wedge palm. Now, there's probably some substrates where that might be a benefit, but for around here in the Pacific Northwest, I know that there is at least one seabed type where this palm not only hurts it, but basically defeats the anchor. And that sandy mud, with this mud palm installed, the anchor was very, very poor. Without it, very, very good. So. Uh, for my use, if I was to use this around here, I would most certainly leave it off because I just can't tell exactly what every seabed is that I encounter. Um, maybe there's another part of the world, maybe in the tropics where you have more just um, coral sands and things, and maybe this is no benefit or no detriment and only a benefit. Uh, that'll have to be discovered by some other tester. Here's an update on the Keel tank conversion project. We'll see that the windows that I had formerly shown you, they have been welded closed. And also we'll see the paint missing and therefore welding on the other side. That's the location of the top plates that have been welded in. So this is the new main fuel tank for the boat. Again, I'm replacing fuel tanks that were formerly well above waterline and therefore uh, moving the center of the gravity of the boat lower and we'll have better sailing performance as a result. Now along with this project, I've made a change back here 
with the interface between the keel and the leading edge of the rudder in this section. Uh, previously, there was a rather deep, sort of a V-shaped, sort of a gap um, between the keel and this leading edge. It was the result of the trailing edge of the keel just being a round tube up against another round tube. Well, what I've done is I've filled that in with sort of a cuff, and it's just a much better hydrodynamically... Uh, a uh, clean way for the water to slide on by the rudder. In addition, I have replaced the lower gudgeon. So the old gudgeon was about 50 years old and it was showing a little bit of wear. It probably would have been fine for another 50 years, but this way we're all nice and tightened up uh, for another 50 years, no problem. Got a new Zerk fitting down here. Um, it was really amazing. The old Zerk fitting, which was of ferrous metal, uh, again, just about 50 years old, and it was in near-perfect condition. Pretty pretty unbelievable. Uh, I've also got a new uh, cutlass bearing ready to go. Uh, now let's go inside, and I'll show you those top plates from uh, the inside of the boat. So here we are in the galley. We see we've got the engine forward here sitting on the floor, and right here, uh, just below where the engine sits, we see the first of three plates. There's the second plate and the third plate. Uh, we'll notice that there is this apparatus here. Um, this tall, larger plate, that's going to be the filler port for the whole tank system. And then the pump will draw from that other port. And that leads with a pipe all the way down to the extreme low point of the tank. Okay, now I will sign off from this wedge anchor test video. And with any luck, here in the next month, I'll get another video out for you. Till then, anchor safely. So long.